U2 began when four teenage friends decided to form a rock group, even though they had no songs and could barely play their instruments. All they had was an intense belief in each other. In a very short period, U2 became the biggest band in Ireland, then the biggest band in Europe, then the biggest band in the world. They became everything they'd ever dreamed of by never letting go of their friendship. You two are legends. This is their story. Bono was born Paul Hewson in Dublin, Ireland in 1960. Before Paul was born, a fortune teller told his mother Iris that she'd have a son whose name would begin with P, and he'd become famous. Iris was a Protestant. Her husband Bobby was Catholic. Paul always felt like an outsider. At St. Patrick's Secondary School, Paul wasn't happy. He often skipped school and would wander the city. In 1972, a new school called Mount Temple opened as the first co-ed, non-denominational high school in Dublin. At Mount Temple, the social and religious divisions of Irish society were left outside. Paul felt at home there immediately. In September of 1974, Iris Hewson died suddenly. Paul would never be the same. I, I actually can't remember that much about um, uh, my own mother, which is odd, I suppose, because I was 14, I think, when she died. She died at, at my grandfather's funeral, which was bizarre. He was a very cool man. And uh, so I woke up one day and the two of them we're gone. Will you be back tomorrow? La, 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 la. Larry Mullen Jr. was two years behind Paul at Mount Temple, but Paul had noticed him in the halls. Larry was a good-looking kid with an air of self-confidence. His mother Maureen was loving and attentive and took her kids to music lessons. One day at his music school, he heard someone playing drums. That, Larry told his mother, was what he wanted to do. In the fall of 76, at his father's suggestion, Larry pinned up a notice on the bulletin board at Mount Temple asking if anyone was interested in starting a band. Dave Evans was the first to respond. He and his older brother Dick showed up at Larry's house for the first band meeting with their friend, Adam Clayton. He looked like a negative of Michael Jackson. He had a blonde afro from sort of north side Dublin perspective. He looked like he was coming from another planet. And he, he'd been thrown out of public school uh, one of the best schools in the country, and, uh, and, I, and I ended up as a punishment in Mount Temple, which was a free school, a progressive school, but a, but a free school. And, and he just, he looked like the, I mean, he certainly thought he was the coolest guy on the block. And, and were it not for the blonde afro, uh, he, he, he might have been. Adam talked his parents into getting him a bass guitar. He didn't quite know how to play it yet, but at the first meeting at Larry Mullen's house, he threw around terms like gig, jam, and fret action, and the rest of the boys were suitably impressed. The first rehearsal took place in, in my kitchen in, at home in, in Dublin, and uh, it, was, it was just god-awful. I can't tell you. <laughs> just, it, it was bad to start out with, and um, it didn't get better for a lot of years. You know, I think it's what I quoted. I was in charge for about an hour and a half, and then Bono opened his mouth, and it was all over. I was relegated behind the drums, and it's been like that ever since. Paul arranged for the group to rehearse in a classroom at Mount Temple, and they decided to call themselves Feedback. I think that name came out really because it was the predominant sound of, of our rehearsals for probably about four months just this wailing feedback from, from the microphone that we used to plug into one of the guitar amps. I just remember getting a, a real, just, just a sense of, this is the most extraordinary sound I've ever heard. And, and it was still out of time and out of tune. And I thought if it, may, if, it, if, it may, if it made other people feel half what it's making me feel, then this is, the, this, is the way I want, this is the way I want to spend the rest of my life. I mean, I really I remember feeling very early on um, a strong messianic complex coming on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Megalomania set in very early on with you two. They changed the name of the band to The Hype and began rehearsing three times a week. About this time, Paul and Dave got new names. 
I guess we were probably in, in feedback or whatever that band was, but maybe the hype. And um, that was just part of the culture of like this group of friends, was this giving of nicknames. And most of the time they weren't particularly complimentary. They, uh, they were an attempt in some ways to, um, to, to, to nail a certain corner of one's, what you might call, insecurities that you're trying to hide. And so Bono's original nickname was uh, Bono Vox of O'Connell Street. And uh, it got changed at various stages to all sorts of unmentionable versions. And the, I, actually, my first nickname was, for about six months, I was known as Inchicore, which is a district of Dublin. And then, uh, then The Edge happened. And the, at the time, it was because of my chin. The Hype got a couple gigs and started working on their own songs. They were influenced by Bowie, The Jam, Television, and Patti Smith. The first concert I ever went to was The Clash. In, in Trinity College, and I never, you know, I've never seen anything like it, because it, it was it, it was a white riot. It was literally was there was a sense that anything could happen. It was confrontational, and I remember barging my way up to the front, you know, to, to be in the middle of the riot <clears throat> for whatever reasons. When you're 17, you want to you know we'll see what it's like. That was it, and I was in. In March of 78, Adam was expelled from Mount Temple for streaking across the campus. He began acting as the full-time promoter and manager of The Hype. By the time The Hype had changed their name to U2, Edge's brother Dick had drifted out of the group. U2 would always be Larry, Bono, Adam, and The Edge. In March of 1978, Larry spotted an ad for a talent contest sponsored by Harp Lager and CBS Records. We didn't really think that we had a hope in hell of, of winning this talent competition. I think there was a £500 um, cash prize and a guaranteed record deal. So we entered this competition and we in fact won it, um, which was amazing. You two went home exhilarated. They decided they needed a manager. Paul McGuinness worked in the Irish film business and was interested in getting into music. On May 25th, 1978, he saw U2 perform. He was impressed. Paul agreed to manage the band. One of the first things Paul McGuinness did for us as a manager was get us served alcohol. That was when, okay, he's gonna come in handy. There's a place I go that takes me far away. And there's a late, late show where I can grow. In late 1978, a personal tragedy shook U2. Larry's mother, Maureen, was killed in a car accident and Larry was heartbroken. He tried to withdraw from his friends and from U2, but Bono wouldn't let him. He came around to my house and just said, look, I understand what's going on because it happened to me and uh, maybe I can help you. And that was, you know, and he, he basically forced me to be in the band. Uh, when I say that, I mean, he, he wouldn't let me go. And uh, during the early years being on the road, I mean, I was 18 and 19 and I was scared, you know? I really was scared. I, I you know, knew nothing about what I was entering. I had no idea. Um, and he, I don't think he did either, but he was just a lot more streetwise than I was. And um, at times it just got really hard, and he was always there, he was always around. I was just, didn't, we wouldn't even have to say anything, just I knew that he knew. He knew what was going on, and he understood what was going on. And, you know, it's been a long relationship, and it's, it's based on very deep things. And Bono was probably the only person in the world who could really hurt me and I would be able to stand back and go it's fine it's okay I could deal with it not long after Larry's mother died some of you two's friends persuaded them to come to a meeting of a charismatic Christian group called Shalom they sang gospel songs prayed together and discussed the Bible Larry Bono and Edge began to attend the meetings regularly Adam wasn't interested we were just really curious 
I'm just really curious. It's the big question, you know. And and it's um, it still is. And the stuff that I picked up in that intense period of time, I'm still living on. At the start of 1980, U2 ended an Irish tour at the National Stadium in Dublin. 2,000 people showed up. It was the largest crowd they had ever played to, and they delivered a riveting performance. The show climaxed with more than 30 people dancing on the stage. A talent scout named Bill Stewart offered the group a deal with Island Records on the spot. U2 went into the studio to record their first album with producer Steve Lillywhite. Boy captured a freshness and optimism that had been lacking in rock for years. I was on the outside when you stay, you stay and you let me in. I was looking at myself, I was crying, I could not see you. I think the reason why we probably didn't emulate or simulate is we couldn't. We couldn't play other people's material when we started, so we had to develop our own. And uh, it was because we started, I think, writing early. We started uh, working on our own compositions early is, is the reason for, I think, what I believe is an original sound. Boy was released in October to very positive reviews. On December 6, 1980, the band made their American debut at the Ritz in New York City and won over the jaded Manhattan crowd. U2 started getting played on college radio. Eager to confront the American market head on, U2 played ballrooms, colleges, and small clubs across the US. Watching the landscape of America go by the bus window, Bono scribbled lyrics for new songs. The life of a rock and roll band on tour was full of temptations. Bono, Larry, and Edge struggled to reconcile their Christian beliefs with their chosen profession. It was certainly incongruous, you know, to see a rock and roll band down the back of their tour bus, you know, with their heads in the, in the back of the Bible, you know. It was causing a rift between the three believers in Adam who was trying to have the time of his life. He was a 21-year-old in a rock band on tour in America. It was all he ever wanted. He intended to live it up. Manager Paul McGinnis sided with Adam. He wasn't against their Christian beliefs, he just didn't share them. And he saw that it was causing a problem within the band. What we went through in the, in the early 80s was a, a very, ex, a kind of baptism of fire. We went, we went down to the water and we, we just almost drowned in it, you know, it was just our heads were under the water there. Their born again friends were telling them that they needed to quit the band in order to live a Christian life. Paul McGinnis and Adam Clayton were horrified that Bono, Edge, and Larry were seriously thinking of breaking up the group as a sacrifice to God. It looked like U2 was going to put out the fire just as it was getting started. In the summer of 1981, U2 was torn between the music that had given their lives meaning and the Christianity that had given them peace. It did not seem that the two could coexist and the tension threatened to break up the band. Adam Clayton, who was not born again, saw his three friends slipping away and taking U2 with them. Larry was the first to decide that the born again Christians were asking for too much. Bono followed. Edge hesitated. Bono and he went for a walk. Edge expected Bono to lobby on behalf of the band. He didn't. Bono told Edge to follow his heart. Edge decided to stick with U2. We went through a couple of, I think it was about a month, where really we had to do a lot of soul searching. And, and in the end, we, we were pretty unanimous in, 
in the way we felt that, you know, this, there was no problem. It was just other people's problems. And we, we just carried on. On August 21st, 1982, Bono married his high school sweetheart, Allison Stewart. Bono asked Adam to be the best man. It was a gesture of renewed loyalty after their born again period. U2's touring in America had built a strong following. The new cable channel MTV was playing their videos. They needed to make an album that would deliver on their promise. War presented a focused, grown-up U2. The group had found their voice. Bono's stage act grew more elaborate and more dangerous as U2's audiences got bigger. He was trying to connect with the crowds in the same way that he had in the small clubs. He began a ritual of taking a white flag from the stage out into the crowd and climbing the scaffolding, balconies, and speaker columns. The audiences got crazier too. At one show, Bono climbed up the balcony and was mobbed with fans. In an effort to escape, he jumped 20 feet to the crowd below. By the time he reached the stage again, Bono's clothes were ripped to shreds and his flagpole was split in half. U2 played to their biggest crowd yet as part of the three-day US Festival in California. With 125,000 people in the audience, Bono had to work hard to get everyone's attention. He did it, but he nearly killed himself in the process. It had got pretty scary on, on some of the shows. So yeah, there'd been a policy of, you know, don't leave the stage without written permission from all three of us. <laughs> While on tour in America, you 2 saw an exhibition at the Chicago Peace Museum called The Unforgettable Fire. The exhibit was a collection of paintings and drawings by the survivors of the bombings in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The Peace Museum also had a collection of work dedicated to Martin Luther King Jr. It was with these images in mind that the band went home to Dublin to make their next album. I guess after the war tour and the subsequent step that Under a Blood Red Sky achieved for us, um, we as, I think we as a band realized that we really had to kind of pull it together as the band to go the next stage. It was either an end of something or it was a beginning of something else. And the unforgettable fire was what that new beginning was. On July 13th, 1985, U2 played to the world at Live Aid. They were an up and coming band compared to the music heavyweights that were performing that day. But they took the stage at Wembley and stole the show. I think there was generally a feeling that, you know, we'd done something very uncool in England, which was the capital of cool, um, by actually showing some emotion on the day and, and actually taking the event seriously for what it was. The thing that I'm most proud of being a part of is Live Aid. Being there and actually seeing music, not just make a difference in people's lives, but actually save lives, was something I... Uh, I'd always felt, but I'll never really recover from. U2 had arrived. Rolling Stone magazine hailed the group as the band of the 80s. In 1986, U2 headlined Amnesty International's Conspiracy of Hope tour. The last show at Giant Stadium was broadcast on MTV and featured an all-star cast, including a reunion of the police for their last performance together. To 
At the end of the police's set, they handed their instruments to you too. It was a symbolic passing of the torch to the new biggest band in the world. You two had finally achieved their goal. They were now a stadium band, rock superstars, and cultural spokesmen. They had no idea what they were in for. Yeah. In 1986, U2 were on top of the world. Rock's biggest underground band had burst into the mainstream. Inspired by Live Aid, Bono and his wife Ali volunteered to go to Ethiopia where they worked in refugee camps. They also visited El Salvador and Nicaragua with Amnesty International. They saw the effects of U.S. foreign policies when they witnessed the bombing of a small village. The experience inspired the song Bullet the Blue Sky. When they recorded the song, Bono told The Edge to put El Salvador through his amplifier. U2's exploration of the Americas was musical, too. Born in the 60s, they had grown up on Bowie, T-Rex, and New Wave. For the first time, U2 began listening to country, blues, and early rock and roll, music they had ignored before. The result was a landmark album. The Joshua Tree's subject, metaphorically and musically, was America, and America loved it. In the UK, The Joshua Tree went platinum in 48 hours, making it the fastest selling record ever released. The album subsequently topped the charts in 22 countries and gave U2 their only number one singles in America, With or Without You, and I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. The record won the Grammy Award for Album of the Year. Tickets to their show sold out immediately. In Holland, 92,000 tickets sold out in less than an hour. U2 had become a phenomenon. The Joshua Tree Tour stretched through 1987, with U2 performing over 100 concerts in Europe and the US. Along the way, director Phil Juanu began shooting a tour documentary. Rattle and Hum started out as a small behind-the-scenes film about a rock band on the road. No one can really remember when it changed from being this small film that we were comfortable with, that we understood what it was, into this big thing that happened. But at a certain point, that shift occurred, and some of it I, 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 I think is great. Some of it is, I'm like looking at it going, what were we thinking? Like, who are these people? The film, the accompanying book, and double album were blasted by critics, who accused you two of being presumptuous to place themselves in the rock pantheon with the likes of Elvis, Dylan, and B.B. King. We'd really had the stuffing kicked out of us a bit, because what we'd, what we'd set out to do on the Joshua Tree tour that led into the Rattle and Hum movie and album was really have a bit of fun with music roots and get away from being so serious all the time. Unfortunately, 
we just were not good at doing that. <laughs> That's kind of what it told us. The movie bombed at the box office, but fans loved the record. It topped the charts on both sides of the Atlantic. We were fans. It was a record made by fans. That's what Rattlin' Home was. That's why we put a picture of ourselves looking up at uh, Johnny Cash's photograph in Sun Studios. I think some people thought we were trying to ingratiate ourselves with these guys, and we, we were, we were, we, we put ourselves up with them, which we certainly didn't. So, you know, you know, uh, there was good, you know, there was good tunes on that. As you two were making preparations for the 1989 Love Town tour of Australia with BB King. Adam was arrested at a pub in Ireland and charged with possession of 19 grams of marijuana and intent to sell. It was not Adam's first brush with the law. Back in 1985, he was arrested for drunk driving. If convicted on the drug charges, his visas could have been denied and he would not have been able to tour. He pled guilty on the possession charge and paid a fine of 25,000 pounds. Adam had always been the rowdy of the band. Great success only encouraged his reckless behavior. You too forged ahead with the tour, but they were less than enchanted with the task. At one point, Larry told Bono that he was tired of being the human jukebox churning out everyone's favorite U2 hits. I remember going to Bono and just saying, you know, this is not working. I saw Bruce Springsteen, and he's a guy who's been at this a long time. Uh, he had that joy on the stage. He was really enjoying it. He was loving it. He said, we get up on stage, and it's hard work. It's like we're working at it, we're working at it, we're struggling every single gig. And I said, it's just not much fun anymore. And maybe it's time to reconsider this whole thing because um, I'm sort of tired of it. I'm actually tired of doing this, like this. Um, and he said, yeah, take your point. At a New Year's Eve concert in Dublin, Bono told the crowd that this was a going away party for you too. This is just the end of something for, for you too. It's no big deal, just we have to go away and just dream it all up again. It was the last night of the decade and the press speculated that the band of the 80s was over. And in a way it was. The band that was U2 in the 80s ceased to exist. The 90s would bring a new U2. You're dangerous. At the start of the 90s, U2's future was a blank slate. For the first time, the band was at a loss for what to do next. Bono said they should tap into the energy of the new Europe. The Cold War was over and the Berlin Wall was coming down. Bono thought it was time for them to make new music for a new era. U2 flew into East Berlin on the last flight before East Germany faded into history. They set up camp at Hansa Studios, the site of David Bowie's groundbreaking work with Brian Eno in the 70s. Bono figured that U2 would be inspired by the spirit of the place and the fervor of reunification. It was a good theory, but in reality, Hansa Studios was falling apart, and the band ended up staying in a sleazy hotel in the former East Berlin. But the biggest problem U2 faced was a division that almost broke up the group. Edge had been getting into a lot of experimental electronic music, and Bono was raving about dance rhythms at the Manchester club scene. 
going into that record, Bonner and I had worked on maybe two or three songs that we, we thought were really special that could go all the way. And um, it was a bit of a departure for the band. So there was this thing of, well, Bonner and Edge are writing songs. They say they're great. They're taking us off in some different direction. And really, I felt Adam and Larry's resistance. There was a lot of confusion, though I think everyone was suffering from it. It was this feeling that we had to forge a new sound for the band, but none of us really knew how to do that. It was the first time ever that you two uh, would come together as a band and play and nothing would happen. As the darkness of winter closed in on Berlin, the sessions dragged on and the band felt like they weren't getting anywhere. Edge started talking about splitting up the group. Larry felt that if they had to choose between the band and their friendships, you two would have to go. It had got pretty grim in Berlin. There was a lot of shouting and, you know, people threatening to kill each other. I could see the headlines, you know. The term musical differences, you know, starts to loom. And I thought, oh, this is, this could get messy. And then, out of the blue, popped this song one. I just remember walking into the control room and hearing this guitar riff, which is the guitar riff from one. And I just said, that is it. This is, this is something special. Is it getting better? And within like 20 minutes, we were playing this thing and it was, everyone was getting off on it. And um, that was the real turning point, I think, for me on the record, because I really felt that there was something very special in that tune. We're one, but we're not the same. We get to carry each other, carry each other. Whoa. That just felt right. I mean, may maybe it summed up the way we felt as a band, trying to kind of go somewhere and, and not being able to at the time. Once they realized they could still make music together, U2 was ready to go home. Back in Dublin, Bono, Larry, Adam, and The Edge had a serious discussion about their expectations of each other and the band. They listened to the tapes from Berlin and realized that they had a lot of good material to work with. The whole session kind of turned around from then on and everyone was, was much more focused and enthusiastic and it kind of dispelled the, that tension. And then Adam and Larry started to get inspired and then they came up with some great stuff and we were off. Octone Baby broke the U2 mold. Unlike the down-to-earth optimism of their earlier work, this record was dark and spacey and you could dance to it. Octone Baby was released in November of 91 to universal acclaim and worldwide success. Now U2 had to figure out a way to take this music on the road. Welcome to Zoo TV, y'all. The latest and greatest in software, hardware, and menswear. Let's hope this shit works. Let's see what we got on TV. We will, we will rock you. For the Zoo TV tour, U2 put together a mixed media barrage complete with exploding cannons, costume changes, and a belly dancer. Bono adopted the stage character of The Fly, a megalomaniacal rock star. You know, I had Jim Morrison's pants on, Lou Reed's shades, Elvis's jacket. I mean, it was like a denticit pop star, you know just going for it, you know, full tilt. And that's what Zoo TV was. It was like we were getting killed in the media. So we decided to have fun with that. So out came the goggles. And I've been wearing them ever since. Inspired by CNN's 24-hour-a-day coverage of the Gulf War, Zoo TV's 36 video screens beamed a shower of brilliantly edited images of pop culture and cruise missiles. Bono would make crank calls from the stage to order 10,000 pizzas, call a cab, or dial up the White House to try and get President Bush on the phone. Um, I, actually, I, I'd like to speak to the President if I could. He's not available to the phone. It was a spectacle of tastelessness and excess and a grand parody of pop star narcissism. But it was funny, and a welcome break from the band's old holier-than-thou image. Demand for tickets outweighed supply 10 to 1. In August of 1992, U2 made a guest appearance on Rockline, a national phone-in radio show. 
They got a call from the media-savvy presidential candidate, Bill Clinton. Should we call you Governor or Bill? No, you call me Bill. All right, uh, and you can call me Betty. Uh, <laughs> Understand I have nothing against you two. You may not know this, but they try to call me at the White House every night during the concert. By the next time we face a foreign policy crisis, I will work with John Major and Boris Yeltsin, and Bill Clinton can, can consult Boy George. The European leg of the tour commenced in May of 1993. Bono adopted a new stage persona for the European crowds. He became Macfisto, the devil in the form of a tired old pop star. He was the fly after he got fat and old and was playing Las Vegas. Macfisto mocked rock superstars, including Bono himself. He loved playing the role. Manager Paul McGuinness entered into contract renegotiations with Island Records. U2 was in a position of power. They were the most popular rock band in the world, and they had sold 50 million records for Island. The label was not about to lose their crown jewel. They offered U2 a $70 million deal for the next six records. It was the financial coup that the band would need. The Zoo TV tour was such a giant undertaking that the cost of putting the show on the road ate up the proceeds. Without corporate sponsorship, the band paid for the tour themselves. And U2's commitment to keeping ticket prices low for their fans resulted in only small profits. In Australia, toward the end of the tour, Adam went out partying and missed a gig. That had never happened before. The band drafted Adam's bass roadie and played the show without him. Afterward, Adam had to confront the fact that his rock and roll lifestyle had begun to threaten his relationship with the band. By the time the tour ended three weeks later, Adam was clean and sober. He had almost drifted away from the group, but his friends would not let him go. Meanwhile, Edge had fallen in love with Morley Steinberg. Morley was a choreographer who had joined the last leg of the tour as the belly dancer who came on stage to tempt Bono during Mysterious Ways. It was a funny thing. It wasn't really until we were around each other a lot that we got a chance to really get to know one another. And now we have our, our baby, Cyan, who's like nearly a year old. and. We're still, still much in love. At the end of 1993, Bono, Edge, Adam, and Larry went back to Dublin after nearly two years of touring. They had accomplished what many would have thought impossible. They had completely changed U2's sound and image while maintaining their enormous popularity. In the process, they managed to go from being the hottest band of the 80s to the coolest band of the 90s. Everyone wondered what they would do next. The second half of the 90s would give U2 some of their proudest moments, as well as their biggest failure. U2 spent 1996 recording a new album. Most people expected them to return to mainstream rock. The band had no desire to repeat themselves. Bono wanted to do a tour that would top even Zoo TV. Larry and Adam were not even sure they wanted to tour at all. One thing they agreed about, they did not want to again spend months selling out football stadiums and not see the big money at the end. U2 wanted a multi-million dollar production and bring the show to the third world and keep ticket prices down without corporate sponsorship and do it all within one year. The math didn't add up, but they ignored the warnings and plowed ahead with their plans for a huge stadium tour while writing and recording their new album. The first sign of trouble came when they didn't have the album finished in time for its Christmas release. Instead, U2 used what was supposed to be their tour rehearsal time to finish the record. They recorded the final vocal on the morning the album was mastered. 
We were in the throes of the album. We were really working very hard. It was it was it was a hard record to make, and I think we um, we got blinded. You two painted themselves into a corner with pop. The band had committed to tour dates before the recording of the album was done, and the record suffered as a result. You two gave a press conference at Kmart to announce the tour they called Pop Mart, and were making fun of the idea of selling themselves. We're here basically to sell our tour to the world, and I don't think there's anywhere better really than, than Kmart to do that. Many people didn't get the joke. In April of 1997, the Pop Mart tour opened in Las Vegas with a live broadcast on ABC. The band wasn't ready. They were not familiar with the new material. The ABC U2 special was the lowest rated non-news show in major network history. Most bands don't survive what we went through. They just wouldn't survive it. It's just, it was so incredible. You know, we had a huge tour that was costing millions and millions of dollars a week to put on and the album wasn't happening. You know, the record company were fighting and the reviews of the album were sort of a little lukewarm. And it was a major, major mistake and we'll never do it again. He says, no, and, and we won't. By the time the Pop Mart tour reached Europe and South America, U2 was well rehearsed and on top of their game. The Pop Mart tour provided U2 with some memorable highlights. In September, they performed in Sarajevo. It was the first time a rock concert had been staged in the war torn city since 1992. Then in the spring of 1998, U2 participated in a free concert in Belfast to raise support for the Northern Ireland Peace Accord. At the concert, the two men who negotiated the agreement, Protestant David Trimble and Catholic John Hume, joined Bono on stage to encourage voters to pass the Good Friday referendum. The accord passed. In October, Trimble and Hume won the Nobel Peace Prize. In early 1999, U2 went back into the studio to make a new album on which they would strip away all artifice. They promised each other that if this album was not great, it would be their last. They worked without a time limit and finally finished in the fall of 2000. The new album was called All That You Can't Leave Behind. It was built around beautiful melodies, heartfelt singing, and the sound of four musicians playing together in a small room. The response was overwhelming. Rolling Stone called it U2's third masterpiece, after The Joshua Tree and Octone Baby. As the century drew to a close, U2 had been together for more than 20 years. They had survived dizzying highs and terrible lows. U2 was born out of the friendship of four teenage boys who didn't fit in anywhere until they found each other. In spite of everything they went through, they always stuck together. The four members of U2 were not the same, but they carried each other. Hard as it is to keep it together, it is still possible to have those moments when it is the four of you being able to keep the rest of the world out, and that's kind of what it's about. It's hard to, to really to say in a few, few short sentences what, what everyone brings to the table, because everybody brings, in the end, brings everything they have, and, and that's, that's a lot, because it's four very smart, very independent, thinking people. I don't want to be in a crap band. And if the, the minute uh, U2 becomes a crap band, we're, we're, you know, we're all out of here. And, and crap does not mean it's not measured but in sales um, or, or even relevance. It's about the sense of adventure. Is it still there? Are you still... Are you still blowing your own mind? Are you, uh, are you still growing as a musician and as a songwriter and as a, as a person? And I, I think in you two that we are. It's kind of indescribable, but it's a very special thing. And um, I really, I don't want it to end. I don't want the, I don't want the experience to end. I know it'll, it, you know, the band may have to do less and maybe record less and whatever. But whatever it is that's special between the band, I, I never want that to finish. See the canyons broken by cloud. See the tuna fleets clearing the sea out. See the bed when fires at night. See the oil fields at first light. 